Hello, my name is Janet Lord, and I'm a board member of the United States International Council on Disabilities. This module is entitled the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, the CRPD. It is an overview module and the first in this online learning series brought to you by the U.S. International Council on Disabilities with the generous support of Rehabilitation International. This is one of the foundational modules for this online learning course in that it provides a basic overview of the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, or the CRPD. It also provides some additional resources for more in-depth coverage. So let's begin. This slide reviews the key learning objectives for this module. Each module in this series has learning objectives. The ones for this module include understanding the rationale and context for the development of the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. It also seeks to identify key concepts reflected in the CRPD that ought to inform disability inclusive development or disability inclusion in international cooperation programs. We also want to understand a bit about the structure and the overall content of the CRPD. And finally, we want to start to appreciate how the CRPD is working change in processes and programs of international development. Now to provide a very brief review of the historical context, we can begin here. Now the foundational international human rights instruments barely reference disability rights issues. And here we're referring to the Universal Declaration on Human Rights adopted by the General Assembly in 1948. We're also talking about the two initial covenants the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and the Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. Those instruments fail to reference disability in their general non-discrimination clauses, and they barely reference disability at all. The United Nations Standard Rules on the Equalization of Opportunities for Persons with Disabilities was an important step forward. It's a non-binding disability specific document, so it's not a legally binding treaty. It was adopted in 1990, and it did, importantly, reference international cooperation among its several rules. Now, the UN Disability Program housed in the United Nations Department of Economic and Social Affairs, or we like to call it UNDESA, was the focal point for disability within the UN system. And there at the time, prior to the adoption of the CRPD, disability was largely addressed by the United Nations as a social development issue. Not, however, a more comprehensive human rights issue. So that's just a little bit about the context. We could talk even more about some non-binding instruments adopted even earlier, during the 1970s, for example. These instruments, like the Declaration on Disabled Persons, reflect a very much outdated and not at all a rights-based approach to disability, and they certainly do not reflect current understandings or conceptualizations of, of disability. Now, to understand a little bit more about the CRPD drafting process and how it contributes to the development of disability inclusive development, you might wish to review this video developed by Professor Michael Stein of the Harvard Law School Project on Disability and one of the lead drafters of the CRPD. 
It provides also an extremely helpful overview of the CRPD. So I invite you to look at that at your leisure. The next several slides address how, under international human rights law, disability is conceptualized. It also reviews other models of disability that are very important for understanding and conceptualizing how we want to think about disability in the context of development, in the context of international cooperation programs that seek to support individuals with disabilities. So let's take a look. First of all, what do we mean by disability? Well, if we look at the CRPD, we get some clues about what we're talking about here. Under the CRPD Article 1, persons with disabilities include those who have long-term physical, mental, intellectual, or sensory impairments, which in interaction with bar various barriers may hinder their full and effective participation in society on an equal basis with others. Now, notice that understanding of disability is in Article 1 of the CRPD, not in Article 2, which is actually the definitions provision in the CRPD. So disability is not actually defined in the treaty. Rather, the treaty explains who is covered by the CRPD in Article 1. The drafters understood that disability has no universal definition and that it is subject to change and may be defined differently for different purposes. So for example, disability can and in fact should be conceptualized very broadly for non-discrimination legislation and policy, but more narrowly for access to social protection or financial assistance for example. Now on to the models of disability. Impairments can certainly pose difficulties. In some cases, persons with disabilities experience chronic illness, but this is certainly not the case for everyone. In fact, the case really only for a small minority of individuals with disabilities. What persons with disabilities need is equal access to health care, and in some instances, they require access to rehabilitation services. Too often in human rights instruments prior to the adoption of the CRPD, disability is reflected as a medical issue requiring medical intervention. That's what we mean when we talk about the medical model of disability. This refers to an understanding or a conceptualization of disability as a narrow medical problem that needs to be fixed, quote unquote, or an illness that needs to be cured. This clearly is a very narrow understanding of disability. It doesn't leave a whole lot of room for thinking about the broad array of rights to which persons with disabilities, as for all human beings, are entitled. So again, under the medical model approach to disability, we see here a visualization and it reflects the person as quote unquote, the problem. And impairments, while they often pose challenges, are not the primary problem under different conceptualizations of disability. So here we see the medical model of disability represented by this photo or this uh, particular drawing where the problem is, is characterized as individual, inherent in a particular person. And here we understand that there are traditional views associated with this medical model. The individual is impaired, is the problem, and needs, for example, medical intervention or rehabilitation. Well, why does this matter in thinking about the design and implementation 
of international development projects. While it's important because historically, too often, international development projects have focused on a very narrow range of interventions for persons with disabilities, while ignoring access to the full range of development interventions that impact the lives of persons with disabilities. So this slide uh, shows a visual to reflect the medical model framing of disability. The confused emoji character is saying, what? I'm not sick and I don't need a cure. So stop asking if I need one. It is intended to convey the narrow focus of the medical model of disability that we've been talking about. It tends to ignore the social barriers that inhibit participation for persons with disabilities. And finally, it ought to be recognized that the medical model may work well in some instances. For example, for someone with a broken leg, that person can receive medical intervention and a cure. The broken bone can mend. Nonetheless, that person is likely to face some barriers as they recuperate, as they may be relying on crutches or being or using a wheelchair, and therefore they may actually experience the disabling impact of barriers in society. The disability uh, model associated with the charity model regards persons with disabilities as objects of pity and charity and helpless dependency. It tends to characterize individuals with disabilities as, as people who are not able to live independently or even make decisions on their own. This approach characterizes the rather standard approach to addressing disability in international and humanitarian contexts. Of course, the CRPD is shifting this approach in very significant ways. This slide presents the charity model of disability in a visual format. Again, we have here an emoji, this time a rather irritated emoji, saying, no thanks, I'm not looking for a handout. Being included like everyone else would be just fine. While traditional approaches taken by individuals and organizations towards persons with disabilities have too often expressed a charity model or orientation of disability. This may be a well-meaning perspective, but a charity model tends to regard persons with disabilities as passive agents, people who just need a handout or charity and who can't do anything for themselves. This approach tends also to dismiss or disregard the voices of people with disabilities themselves. And now on to the social model of disability. You already have a sense of that from looking at the language in Article 1 of the CRPD that certainly reflects a social model orientation to disability. The social model focuses on eliminating the barriers in the social environment or the physical environment or the communication environment that inhibit the ability of persons with disabilities to exercise their human rights. So what does the social model do? Well, it provides a perspective that understands the need to identify and break down barriers in society and to address not only the medical and rehabilitation needs of persons with disabilities, but all of their needs and the fulfillment of all of their human rights as human beings. And finally, here we have a social model framing of disability depicted by the emoji with the caption, yep, that's more like it. I can be a part of this community if these barriers are addressed. It's not rocket science. And so this two diagram illustrates the social model of disability, and it's a way to depict the social model 
and it reflects that barriers in society are the ones that pose serious problems for persons with disabilities, not individual deficit. And these barriers include things like environmental barriers and attitudinal barriers and organizational or institutional barriers as well. So this slide invites you to pause and consider the practical impacts of various models of disability in the spheres of development cooperation and humanitarian assistance. So how might the charity or medical models of disability impact programming in the development or humanitarian sectors? How do you think it might impact program design? Think of some specific examples. And think about how these different models of disability might specifically impact the design of for example, an education project, or an employment project, a rehabilitation project, an HIV and AIDS project, or a justice sector project, or any other area of development that you might think about. So to sum up the models of disability and approach set out in the CRPD, we can say, and it is often said, that the convention marks a paradigm shift in attitudes and approaches to persons with disabilities. It certainly does reflect the social model understanding of disability. Persons with disabilities are no longer seen as objects of charity or, or simply targets of medical treatment or rehabilitation and social protection, but rather as agents as subjects with rights, as people perfectly able to claim their rights and make decisions based on their free and informed consent. In short, persons with disabilities in the CRPD are active and equal members of society. Now let's look at some of the core concepts reflected in the CRPD. We've seen, of course, that it expresses a social model understanding of disability. It also sets forth a very comprehensive set of rights in a disability specific context. So it covers civil, political, economic, social, and cultural rights. It provides a duty to provide reasonable accommodation and that duty becomes an integral element of non-discrimination that is in, owed to an individual with a disability. Accessibility is another important concept and obligation set out in the treaty, and it addresses broad-based measures to benefit persons with disabilities and other groups collectively. Disability in the CRPD is understood as heterogeneous and reflects natural human variation. This slide shows the general principles of the CRPD and they're set out in Article 3 of the treaty. These principles must inform the interpretation of all provisions across the treaty. They should also inform the development of domestic law and policy and internal policies of institutions and organizations, including non-governmental organizations, and of course, organizations of persons with disabilities, as well as development organizations and development donors, like the United Nations, or like the World Bank, or the European Union, or any number of bilateral donors, like the United States, Australia, Finland, or the United Kingdom. We've seen that non-discrimination is both a general principle of the CRPD, but it's also a core obligation. The prohibition against discrimination on the basis of disability in the CRPD includes both direct and indirect discrimination. It includes, as we've seen, the duty to provide reasonable accommodation. Reasonable accommodation is defined in the treaty as 
necessary and appropriate modification and adjustments that don't impose a disproportionate or undue burden and where needed in a particular case to ensure that persons with disabilities enjoy on an equal basis with others all of their human rights. The CRPD's definition provides four elements that must all be met in order to be considered a reasonable accommodation. Element one is, is there a necessary modification or adjustment? In other words, does an individual with a disability, in order to access their particular right, or for example, their right to employment, is there a necessary modification or adjustment required? needed. Element two, if yes to element one, we then go on to ask, is that modification or adjustment one that's necessary and appropriate? Element three, if yes to elements one and two, then goes on to ask, is the potential accommodation being provided in a particular case? In other words, does the potential accommodation apply to an individual in order to enjoy and exercise human rights? And element four, if all of those first three elements are established, then we go on to see whether the potential accommodation poses a disproportionate or undue burden. If the answer is yes, then the duty bearer is not required to provide the reasonable accommodation. So notice that a reasonable accommodation is provided to an individual. Accessibility is defined by the CRPD committee is a concept that applies collectively. So not to a specific individual person. This slide covers article nine, another general obligation in the treaty, the one on accessibility. We'll see how incredibly broadly accessibility is captured as a concept and an obligation in the CRPD. So under Article 9, accessibility is to enable persons with disabilities to live independently and participate fully in all aspects of life. The obligation on states is to take appropriate measures to ensure to persons with disabilities access on an equal basis with others, to the physical environment, to transportation, to information and communication, including ICT, and to other facilities and services open or provided to the public, including those in urban areas and rural areas as well. Covers in buildings and roads and transport and indoor and outdoor facilities and schools, housing, medical, facilities, workplaces, among others. And again, it also uncovers in, uh, information and communications and other services, including technology and electronic services and emergency services. Accessibility measures are provided to the collective again. So unlike reasonable accommodation, which is the right of an individual, accessibility is to provide it to the collective. There are also cross-cutting provisions, other ones that must be applied and read or interpreted across the entire treaty. These include the following, Article 6 on women with disabilities, Article 7 on children with disabilities, and Article 8, the provision that recognizes that realizing disability rights means undoing stigma, reshaping, transforming, shifting social norms around disability and the various measures that are required in order to raise awareness and understanding about disability. The next slide lists just a few of the rights in the convention like access to justice in Article 13, or the right to education in Article 24, or the right to participate in political and public life in Article 29. 
A few of the other general obligations on states who have ratified the CRPD are reflected on this slide. So Article 4. There, states must ensure that their legal framework is consistent with the CRPD, and that might require various measures like law reform or policy measures, budgeting, and among others. But Article 4.3, very importantly, underscores that persons with disabilities must be consulted in decision-making. This is absolutely critical. It's reflected in other provisions in the treaty as well. And Article 5, the non-discrimination and equality provision also must re be reflected in the domestic law framework. And again, it requires reasonable accommodation to be provided where needed. Article 32 of the CRPD mandates, it requires that international cooperation programs, in other words, development programs, be inclusive of persons with disabilities. The CRPD is transforming international development and humanitarian organizations. This means that the CRPD can be seen as, of course, a human rights instrument, but also an instrument that pertains to international development and humanitarian assistance. Now, a much more detailed review of Article 32 and its implications is provided in a separate module on Article 32. There are national level monitoring and implementation measures in the CRPD. The CRPD in Article 33 on national level monitoring requires the establishment of a national focal point to oversee implementation of the CRPD, and it strongly suggests that states also designate or establish a coordination mechanism or mechanisms within government, understanding, of course, that disability is a cross-cutting issue. Secondly, under national monitoring, Article 33.2, requires that states designate or establish a national human rights institution to play an independent monitoring role. That might be taken up by an existing human rights commission in a country. It might be taken up by a newly created entity like a disability commission. The point here is whatever type of institution, it needs to be independent of government and perform independent monitoring. And finally, Article 33.3 confers a civil society role in monitoring, highlighting, of course, that organizations of persons with disabilities have the right to participate in monitoring implementation, and states must help facilitate that process. There are also monitoring and implementation components or elements in the CRPD that operate at the international level. There's a Conference of States Parties created by the CRPD in Article 40, and that conference meets every year in order to consider any matter with regard to implementation of the convention. It meets in New York yearly. It's an important opportunity, not only for states' parties, but for disability advocates and organizations of persons with disabilities and other key stakeholders from the UN or civil society to come together and consider how the treaty is being implemented. The Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities is also created within the framework of the treaty. Now, this, of course, is the body of independent experts serving in their personal capacity, and they're tasked with reviewing states' implementation of the convention. It currently has 18 members, given that the treaty was very, very quickly ratified, so it has already reached its full complement total of 18 members. And finally, the optional 
protocol to the CRPD is a legally binding separate treaty from the CRPD that states may choose to opt into in order to grant the CRPD committee, the treaty body, extra mandates. If a state does choose to ratify the optional protocol, that means the CRPD committee will be able to review individual or group communications alleging violations of the CRPD by that particular state party and resulting in commu committee recommendations. It would also allow the committee to launch a procedure of inquiry to review grave and systemic violations of the CRPD in a particular country, again, one that has ratified this optional protocol. Now this slide is the last slide in this module. It provides just a couple of additional resources. And it highlights resources that may be especially useful for two different types of stakeholders. So the first is more for civil society organizations. It is a participatory human rights education manual called Human Rights Yes, Action and Advocacy on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, available online. And for governments or parliaments or intergovernmental organizations, there is the handbook for parliamentarians on the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. This would also probably be very helpful for civil society organizations as well. So this concludes the first module in this series brought to you by the United States International Council on Disabilities with the great support of Rehabilitation International. Thank you so much and thanks for listening.